This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with senior lecturer at St Mary's University and former Wales judo CEO, Darren Warner. He discusses his role as CEO and how to create alignment across a pathway, his experience as an elite athlete and how this assisted him when creating skill acquisition models, as well as some fantastic stories regarding how culture can affect athletes in places such as Japan and Cuba. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, please make sure you share it with friends and family. I hope you enjoy. Right, Darren, I am conscious of the fact that we have left a lot of good content off air there, but we can replicate it in this, which I'm excited for. But um, be- before we begin, how are things your end? Are you all good? I'm good, thank you. Um, I'm grateful for the invite and um, always to talk about, always happy to talk about all things coaching and skill acts. So yeah, thanks thanks for inviting me. No worries at all. And I know we have a few mutual friends, acquaintances, that is some former guest, Tom, that we were just talking about there, Tom Reed, uh, yeah. see judo player and a few other people. So I think that, um, yeah, should be a really good conversation, even just from the bit that we've caught up there and a few messages exchanged previously. For people that maybe don't know you, haven't come across your background, could you give us a bit of a whistle-stop tour, I guess, of who you are and what you do at the moment, and then a little bit of a pathway of how you've got to that point? Yeah, sure. So it's quite a... I mean, I'm 51 now, so it's quite a long path. I, I, I will try and whis- whistle-top it. But uh, yeah, so effectively, at the moment, um, and hopefully for the f- foreseeable future, I'm a senior lecturer in skill acquisition at St Mary's. Um, which is actually a fantastic university um, for skill acquisition. So very fortunate um, to be in that role. Um, prior to that, um, I've spent most of my life, um, certainly adult life, in in judo. So I started when I was 10 and I'd always got into trouble for grappling, you know, kids to the ground. And then suddenly I was not only allowed to do it, but encouraged to do it well. So um, that that seemed like a match made in heaven and my parents were thinking, well, this is going to give them discipline. So we were all pretty happy with that. Um, And I was almost instantly doing it every day of the week, twice on Saturdays, because you could just pay quarterly. Um, So yeah, I've kind of just fell in love with it straight away. Um, Left home at 16 to be an elite athlete and also an elite athlete, British champion, competed at world Olympic level for about 10 years. Um, And my coach was a world champion and the Olympic coach. Um, so I had a lot of experience there and I was lucky to, to meet a lot of really good people, um, a lot of ins- very inspiring people um, that made me question what was possible in life, I guess, you know, so it was a, quite a formative time. Um, that led me, and you know, we talked a little bit earlier around how, but that led me to becoming an Olympic coach myself. So um, with GB, I guess I could kind of say I was headhunted. I wasn't really planning on um, a national coaching role, but I was sort of asked, I was encouraged to apply um, and then was successful. Um, and so I led the under 21 and under 23 teams for a good couple of years, uh, of which like, likes of Tom Reed and Ben Fletcher, you've also had on and Megan Fletcher um, were part of. So, um, so that was really good. And that kind of worked very similar to like football with, you know, Gareth Southgate or where they would bring them in for a period of time and compete at internationals. And then they'd go back to their training centers Um, But also I would have players that I was working with on a daily basis as well. So it was kind of like a dual role where you you coaching daily and had your own players who you're responsible for. But then internationally, I was kind of the, you know, the the lead coach. Um, Following the London Olympics, um, I worked with quite a few top players. I coached Gemma Gibbons to Olympic silver in London. So it was quite a nice way to end um, after a home Olympics. Um, And I think we were just having now a second or second child was born the week after the olympics and um my, my wife convinced me in fact she still convinced me that it was the best thing um to not travel around the world constantly um which i'm still at pains with you know 12 years later but um so i became a ceo of a governing body for judo in wales um and i still managed to do some coaching i was coaching natalie powell who's world number one and a double olympian now um I'm still coaching her until Paris, hopefully. Um, yeah, and then post Commonwealth Games, kind of felt that you know eight years as CEO is a long time, and uh, I've always had a 
an itch to scratch with academia. So I was just finishing my PhD and uh, written a book on skill acquisition and just thought, you know, um, saw the saw the role at um, St. Mary's. Probably didn't even think I would get an interview because, you know, I've done academia in terms of studying, but um, not so much. Um, and, you know, there's so these roles are so few and far between. But I was lucky that the, the, the really good people didn't apply. So uh, I was successful there. And now, um, yeah, I get to to talk to uh, people about it on a daily basis, which is great for me. And also be surrounded by some really um, skill act gurus, I would probably refer to them as, you know, like Paul Ford or Jamie North. They're just, yeah, I can geek out a little bit and uh, ask them questions and, yeah, just just learn on a daily basis, I suppose. So, yeah, that's me. Yeah, and I think it's a really nice transition, as you mentioned. There's kind of lots of different points. You go from being on mat constantly to be being on mat a little bit less and then a little yeah. bit less and then a little bit less. But you've always got that thread in there of doing a little bit of coaching, which I would imagine um, knowing what it's like with football, you always want to try and keep some element on the grass if you can, which is which is important. I guess for you um, as a player, and then when you made that transition into coaching, what kind of revelations did you have? Because if I talk from a personal exam, uh, example, I found that me doing the same practices repetitively every Thursday and knowing what I was going to be doing probably didn't aid my development as well as it could have done. Yeah. Um, there was one particular practice that we do uh, under 14s, which involved winning a header and then trying to hook it long, which in today's football, I don't think would be would be appropriate. Um, yeah. It might explain me not being the brightest as well. But um, yeah, yeah I, I'd imagine in terms of the work that I do now, it's kind of the polar opposite. So I guess for you, obviously, you, you are a particularly high level in terms of your uh, yeah. player career. What, what did that look like for you, that transition? It's interesting because I've kind of been able to follow the skill act research as it's grown whilst already having experienced most of that myself so yeah very similar that you know I was one of, I was probably the first generation of elite athletes that train full time so we'd be training you know four or five hours a day um and you know putting my cards on the table I I, I went to train with my coach Neil Adams because he was world champion and had the best technique and he I was going to develop his technique you know so that's how things were done really in in my head I suppose um but I, could, I just remember the same feeling of just thinking like I'm repeating this stuff over and over. My technique is definitely getting better. Um, but is this the most efficient way? Like, is this the fastest way? I just felt like I was in a real hurry. And I, I often felt like a lot of these techniques weren't transferring as skills. Like it's fine. I, you know, with a ass partner assisting me and working together, I could do some amazing throws, but I was never, never really doing them in a, in a pressurized, you know, situation. Um, so so that was something I pondered a lot and didn't really have any answers to. Um, but interestingly, um, because I was running a, a kids club, I restarted. Um, it's fascinating as well, actually, that I restarted Coventry Judo Club's um, children's section. Um, Realised that I love coaching, you know, as, as I was an athlete. But um, that went on to be a really successful club. In, in, in fact, like Chelsea Giles, who was the first medalist in Tokyo, actually started them. So there's me starting something to make a little bit of money. And actually, you don't realise that future Olympians can could be walking through the door. Um, but I was very much that, yeah, that behaviourist, autocratic teacher um, with those children. And I, I felt comfortable being like that because, um, I'm, you know, I was British champion, pretty successful, I felt like the parents really respected me and, and you know, and I was comfortable in that role. And it, But it sort of changed with each age group, you know. So I would do different ages because you've got age age and size is really important when you're doing a grappling sport because, you know, you, you can't really work together. Um, so I would do a lot of different ages and had had good numbers that allowed me to, to do that. And I, I noticed that I just naturally changed things um, and started to create a bit of problem solving for them. But then... What that led to is that when a coach who was the, also the Olympic coach was away, um, and I really don't know how this happened, but I ended up being the person that took the sessions. Um, and I certainly wasn't comfortable enough with my peers, who were also British champions or, you know, some world medalists or, you know, to to be teaching them. So I kind of thought, how am I going to do this? Um, and so what I started to do was watch their fights and look at what 
or areas were they struggling with and then bringing them to the sessions as solutions to look for and so we tried you know i collectively use the groups there's a lot of internationals um in most weights training in the center um, and try and solve those problems together and that worked really well um and i kind of opened my eyes to maybe a different way of doing things and there, there wasn't so much to read about then i guess so a lot of this was just trial and error um and i get yeah um i mean I also used to wonder why, you know, play, you know, doing that repetitive practice, they would improve on the session and then come back on the next session. And it was like, they'd never made any improvements. And I was kind of just thinking, I'm great here. Why can they not retain this? You know? Um, and so, yeah, when I started to read the skill, I can realize that maybe if you could make it a bit more random and give, let them work it out for themselves, um, they're more likely to, to retain it. So I'm just fascinated by all of that stuff, really. And I think this is an area that's just really growing. I don't think that I don't think we're anywhere near there. Um, and so that's what I what I love about it, if I'm honest. But yeah, so it was kind of always there. Um, in fact, I would say I'm least happy if I, if I found a solution. So actually, after um, the London Olympics, I kind of felt that every year I would do something different. But having achieved that success kind of felt a little bit oh okay so I found the answer not yeah where do I go from here um and it took a bit of time to rekindle that passion for um for coaching and I realized that I just can't do the same thing year on year I have to be tweaking it changing it seeing what happens if I do this so I'm just quite antagonistic that it should always be changing and evolving and sometimes that will go badly <laughs> um so the last Olympics um with Natalie I was trying to develop her power endurance and we probably went a little bit too far and then she ended up tearing her oblique seven weeks before the Olympics so um you know it's kind of those things where I take it on the chin and I'm like look, I really you know she didn't think it's my fault you know we were coming up with a training plan together but it was ultimately my idea to change this training approach to to um to be more power endurance and um yeah so sometimes you learn the hard way don't you you know when you're when you try it it's fun to achieve greatness but um, yeah. and, yeah. and listen it, it's one of those things right like when you're at the end you you hear about the number of people that pick up injuries i remember messaging ben before the last olympics going oh, yeah oh, i'm sorry about the leg break assuming that um that would be him done and he was like no nah, i'll make it and you kind of see that switch that goes on in a olympian's mind that goes okay for any normal person with a broken leg probably be thinking that's me done whereas he was like no i'm, I'm going to be going in for that which is yeah obviously testament to him that the fact that he made it what i think that's fascinating particularly around the judo culture um and i guess other fighting sports boxing mixed martial arts and stuff is that element of problem solving because of the i guess the uniqueness of what you're coming up against yeah. Um, I, I think obviously you've got the weight categories that have an element of of um, standardization, but what that weight looks like can be very different. You could have someone with really long arms or really short arms or stocky and short Mike Tyson through to a Tyson Fury and they'd be in the same kind of weight band. Um, and I think from a skill acquisition point of view, that must be fascinating to work in because actually it allows a series of different problems and if you're trying to plot what a tournament could look like there must be like a never-ending cycle of well these are what the prototype fighters look like that I might come up against and here's some of their skills but here's what they're not good at so we're going to focus on xyz I'd imagine it must be like a 10,000 piece jigsaw and yeah, you're not wrong, to be honest. And I think our job is to uh, to simplify something so complex, isn't it, to a certain extent. Um, and that space that you described there is probably where I spend most of my thinking time. It's like, how do we solve those problems? So you mentioned it before, but judo's got a pretty unique culture that, you know, it's, so the person that design, uh, designed the world tour also does um, designed the ATP tour for tennis, where they're just constantly traveling to different countries. Hence the fact my wife didn't think it was a great job, you know, with three, three little boys. Um, but what's different is that, and maybe tennis does this as well to a certain extent, um, we would have training camps for three or four days after each big tournament and you just train with each other, um, which is pretty unique, I think, really. But that's just what we're used to. So um, my approach to that 
and I've always sort of referred to this as an affordance based approach where you know you're what is the environment and seeing the opponent as the environment what do they what opportunities do they afford you so we would take that opportunity to just really try different things but to to hide them a little bit so I might just be one thing one grip that I, I you know I want them to try um and in the, just in the midst of things and but that's what I'm really interested in you but you don't want them to know that that's what you're trying to find out you know and um so yeah uh, that's we, we tend to do that on camps and then profile the opponents really look at the like the, the cues the probabilities um of what are they likely to do and when and then I would try and find training partners or I do try and try, find training partners that, that got that same somatotype, you can do the same techniques um, and we'll, we'll ask them to sort of mimic their their movements and their their strategies. Um, so so that leads the athlete to be used to that position uh, and that situation and finding the solutions themselves. Um, what I found really interesting with that and almost admitting my own flaws or maybe recognising um the greatness of others i've been lucky enough to work with a couple of coaches that have coached multiple olympic champions and my way to do that is to do it with the athlete to solve problems okay this is the situation this person's going to be doing this we need to find some solutions but actually the ones that are at the top top end you know winning a couple of olympics what they do is they don't tell their athlete that they're going to be facing it so they're just coaching the other person without knowing you know so they're having to work all this out themselves um, all these different affordances are there. But I just think that takes it to another level that I've not quite reached yet, if I'm honest, but I kind of see that as the next the next step. Um, so I also worry that that, you know, that fact that I usually work it out with the athlete still creates a bit of a dependency on me um, that I need to, you know, ultimately I'm looking for, you know, autonomy that, um, you know, they're just self-organizing their own fight and, you know, solving the problems at the time but i i worry that actually i'm still a little bit too involved for that to happen so yeah it's it's an ongoing it's an ongoing problem if i'm honest this is going to come across as a slight and i don't mean it this way at all so if any of your your uh, players listen to this please do not come after me <laughs> um do you think that's the difference between kind of multiple world champions or olympic champions and then maybe that tier just below where the very, yeah. very best are capable of almost coming up with those solutions without help. Whereas that little tier below still need a level of assistance. Yeah, I do. And again, so at the moment, we've got a Japanese triple Olympic, a triple world champion in the UK. Um, so when I was CEO of Wow Studio, I set up a partnership with the Japanese Olympic Committee and Japan are like, um, Brazilian football, you know, they're the most skillful. They're actually more successful than Brazilian football, you know, if that's possible. Um, but so because English is the international language for judo, they, to, in order to become an Olympic coach, they send them to the UK um, to learn English and to practice coaching. So we've got this triple world champion. He's just retired um, and he's brought his family with him. And uh, on the first weekend that he's here, his, his son is about he's about 18 months old and he's got this vomiting bug and he's obviously really panicked. So I've taken him to A&E and we were there for about five hours because that's A&E, isn't it? So <laughs> he can't speak English at this point and uh, we're just on Google Translate having a conversation. And so I said, so what's the secret? He, what's the secret to being the best in the world? And he went, oh, it's easy. Like this is, you know, Google Translate. He said, I spend all my time doing what I can't do. And I just thought, wow, like if this guy leaves now, I've already realized that I spent all of my time refining and trying to improve what I was already good at. Um, and actually, he just spent all his time dealing with things, just dealing with the uncomfortable and finding solutions for that. And because he was so good, when he got to the Olympics, everybody was just trying to find a solution for him. Like same, you know, he's the Lionel Messi of judo effectively, you know? So everybody's just trying to find a, a way, just one chink in the armor that they might be able to exploit. They're not trying to be better than him. And he's trying to make sure that he can deal with anything that anybody tries to find, you know? And I just thought that, it, and actually the athlete I was mentioned, it was world number one at the time. And I just thought this is a totally different level to what I'm doing. Um, how lucky am I, you know, to be able to, speak but that was kind of that just that one conversation 
led to so many other conversations around what can this look like um, and what is also really fascinating is that it's, that's kind of his approach to life to a certain extent as well you know how we you know coming to the UK to live for two years here and stuff is just that's going to be difficult I should do that you know mm. and I thought actually yeah um, I agree we, we should challenge ourselves a little bit more and I think as coaches but also in life things just get more comfortable don't they you know so it's like how do we keep recognizing what's difficult and putting ourselves in that position um it's a fascinating balance isn't it because I know that in in football as as well we've got to a stage where there's discussions on do you focus on super strengths and you have a David Beckham that's capable of crossing and that is what his USP is that's what's going to make him a professional footballer or potentially make him a professional footballer if you're a young David Beckham. And then you've got this other food of thought, which is actually, can I be a holistic all-round player that might give me opportunities in a a variety of ways? I'd imagine in in the the fighting context, because you are the creme de la creme and people are coming after you, they are almost looking for a specific problem to your... Uh, sorry, a specific solution to your specific problem, which means you yeah, can't yeah. be like a Dante, Deontay Wilder that has just got a hammer of a right hand that comes in and goes, whack, see you later, good night. You have to I, be I think more so, but right. actually I'm I'm also always, I've always been a um, an avid fan of Super Storms. I guess coming through, I was lucky enough to be on the um, elite coach programme for three years where different national coaches were working together. So I'd work with people like Danny Kerry and Tony Minicello and, and stuff like that. So a lot of us were probably following that same philosophy of super strengths. But I think actually what I realised is the best players in the world aren't brilliant at everything. They are so good at one or two things that nobody can stop them. And actually what happens is when everybody keeps trying to find ways to stop it, it's giving you practice it, refining it and making it even better. But actually... Uh, in that development stage where, you know, I mentioned I was the under 21 and under 23 GP coach. For me, that stage was very much about making them well-rounded and making sure they didn't have these glaring weaknesses that they were going to lose by. So I saw my job there as trying to make them well-rounded and establish work with their co- their coaches if they weren't being coached by me around what do they need to do? Because people just want to win. They're like, well, I've, I'm winning with this. And I'm like, yeah, but you're going to be exposed in this area at the highest level. And we really need to develop that. Um, so um, I believe in both, but ultimately I've seen some brilliant well rounded people, but they're not the best at anything. And they really struggle to, to cross the line. So I, I, I think there needs to be something that you're the best at, you know, definitely think that. Yeah. It's an interesting balance in it. As you said, that you don't, yeah, it's just a fascinating discussion about how you how you'd have that in the development pathway. I guess from from your perspective, when you've gone to more senior roles, you mentioned being a, a CEO of, of an organization. Ultimately, you're in charge of kind of a strategy at that point. And that's obviously looking at the top level and understanding your Olympians and trying to get them to go and giving them support. But that's also looking after what the future looks like and having a pathway or having a development program and process. So from your perspective, I guess, how challenging is it one to, I guess, remove individual bias during that process? Because it'd be very easy just to go, well, this is what I believe. So we're going to do it and like it or lump it and making sure you've got a a level of evidence to support what you're trying to do and I guess then how uh, secondly how challenging is it to future proof because all sports obviously have a situation where the game changes in terms of rules and regulations at points but also just themes and thads like if you look at the i watch premier league um football on on sky sports from 2000s when tottenham were closer to yeah. winning stuff than they are now and the game looks completely different to what it does now so i think that you know everything evolves so how how challenging is that for people that right at the very top when they're looking at those two things um well i think the other thing is that times have changed a lot so i think it was about 2017 the DCMS released like their duty of care report, which really highlighted um, that you should be really taking care of athletes and, you know, the way that you manage them on and off the programs. And because, you know, even the Olympic gold medalists for some sports would be like, right, you're, we're done now and that's it, you know. And so I saw a lot of my friends when I was retiring as an athlete really struggle mentally with that transition. And then I tried to manage that as a coach with the athletes, but ultimately I was often told like, that's not really my job. Your job is to coach them whilst they're here. 
And it, that just never really sat right with me. So it's probably one of the motivations to, to be a CEO. Um, but what I realized is you, your money is ring fenced. And so it's like you spend it on these things because that's what it's for. The, the duty of care and the reason I mention it is that suddenly we this had been highlighted by central government. So we're able to spend money on that, which made it much more possible. So I think there's and UK sports since changed their strap line to medals and more, which again, it just helps, you know, that this is not just about medal. Of course, we need to win medals. That's what inspires the nation. But we're dealing with you know, we're developing people here. Um, and I've always thought if we do it well, by being an elite athlete, you're really learning to be the best version of yourself. You have to be so professional. Like you talked about Ben coming back from uh, breaking his leg. I mean, just the fact that he made the Olympics is incredible, but the diligence that he had every single second of every day when he was awake to to return is just a skill that will put him in good stead for the rest of his life, you know? So... I feel if we do that well, it's well worth them being an athlete. But I've also seen it go badly wrong. Um, so having that responsibility um, is a big one. You know, yeah, I'm well aware of that. But I kind of think, what does the whole journey look like? Not just, you know, and so I probably always tried to coach people that they could become coaches afterwards, you know, get qualifications i was always keen to to work in universities so the reason i know tom so well is that i was based in bath university for a while and i, I just felt that was a good fit you know um and i've so, seen an awful lot of people that feel like you should just be focusing on the sport not anything else um and i've always been a fan of them having almost multiple identities um so that's kind of what i tried to create when i was when i was in wales really as the ceo and then in terms of future proofing i think the igf like footballer you know they change the rules all the time sometimes massively um and actually I, I mean I coached one guy guy called Peter Cousins who's world silver medalist and um he had this amazing he was, he was like a, a bulldozer in terms of strength that he could just push onto people and they would have no they'd have to try and stand their ground and as soon as they push back he would be at a drop underneath them um and he'd just do it against everybody you know it's phenomenal but the reason is we're in we're in a, a square where if you step out you get a penalty. So you either push back or you go out. You get a penalty or you get thrown. You know, and then they just change the rules for one year where if you step out they just say mate and then you you don't get a penalty you go back. And it was a, such a difficult year for him because he was no longer getting that reaction. Um, and I kind of thought what we really need to do is create really really well rounded players that. Are, that know what it's like to have a super strength, but ultimately can solve problems. So that, you know, what what I've seen, and the rules have changed so many times, but the best players adapt the fastest every single time. So it's kind of like, how do we how do we develop these adaptable athletes, these adaptable thinkers? And I think that's yeah, still it's still the conundrum that I'm thinking about. Like, you know, it's by no means like it's a polished idea, but I think that's what we should be aiming for. And I think if, you, if you're if you aiming for that, that's where you'll move towards. Whereas if you don't know, you know, if you're just trying to preempt. So, for example, in swimming, you could say, oh, it's going to be a second faster in four years' time. We can't do that in judo, you know. We can't say, oh, it's more likely to be this. But what we can do is just say, well, we want to create, you know, independent, autonomous thinkers and people that can adapt quickly. Um, and, how and also you... behaviour. How do you put that into a, a, like a curriculum or a program? So obviously that's not only a, you know, a technical and tactical piece for the actual players, but that's mm. like a coach development piece of making sure that you've got coaches that are aligned to that vision and not going, you know, all command and telling them at all, all, all moments what they have to be doing. That's kind of a, a well-rounded structure that's pointed in this direction. So how do you, from the very top, um kind of promote yeah, this vision it's a good it's a good question um so my way of approaching it would be to to establish the, some key situations that they're going to face you know um and so when they're working in the clubs it's like we need you to be good at these situations but ultimately what we're trying to do is develop their ability to problem solve in those situations so if they you know, if we've got 10 to 15 situations at under 21, slightly different at under 23, different at senior, what are the common themes that we see through the analysis that we need them to be able to, to solve? 
and that evolves, but at the same time, um, it doesn't change that much. You know, there's some of the, you know the importance of gripping is always the case. So there was a, there was a phase where you pretty much had to grip within three seconds. So in judo, they break a lot of grips off and your fingers are just hanging off at times, you know, um, like the state of judo players fingers are just, um, to be envied by the world. But, um, but they would usually change it and go, oh, this isn't getting the desired impact we want. And a year later they'd change the rules again. So over time you tend to, to be within, I would say about 80%. And, you know, so the fact that we're changing those situations means that we're keeping them on their toes and they're having to learn and adapt as well. Um, and then I guess, I mean, I remember bringing them in to GB squad training and that the, probably the way that I was delivering was very different to what everybody else was doing. So I remember before junior world championships in 2008, um, I'd analysed every player and the situations that they were struggling with, men and women, so it's 14 players. Um, and we were going to practice these main situations and try and find solutions for each. And I've kind of got a periodization where they find the, the situations throughout the year, but before a main event, like a World or Olympic Championships, they do it under a severely high load so that it's more difficult than what they're going to have to do when they're at the tournament. So that's often fatigue, but, you know, it could be because we've woken them up in the middle of the night and so they haven't had any sleep and then they're having to do it. I, I remember with one girl before the Olympics, um, we were having test fights and she thought she was fighting one person. And as they walked out, that girl walked back and another person walked on to fight her. So she's got this match plan in her head and suddenly she's gripped up and fighting somebody completely different um so i always like to challenge them and to force them to to adapt themselves um sometimes i'd have you know a good laugh about it i wasn't the most popular at times but i remember one of the coaches saying this is not what we normally do you know it's the most important tournament it's the world championships this is not what we normally do and i said i know um but i don't want it to work not work because you've told her this this is not what we normally do. What I would like is for you to back it 100%. And if it doesn't work, I'll, you know, I'll hold my hands up. And um, so he said, yeah, okay, that's fine. But then that girl um, won a world medal. She sort of said, this is the best I've ever fought, you know. And, and her coach was great about it. He was like, yeah, fair play. That, um, I don't know what you're doing there, but it was, but it was good, you know. So I guess there was also the fact that I, I don't, I don't know if I was brave enough or just stupid enough to do what I thought, even though nobody else was doing it. Um, but then I also thought if these things are successful, hopefully they'll take them on as well and start putting them in their own practice. So I saw my role as being able to influence others. And I was, I'm never going to be the guy, you know, I'm talking about developing athletes that think, think for themselves. I'm never going to be the guy that tells the coaches what they should be doing, but I'm hoping by seeing these different types of practices that maybe it gets them thinking um, and, asking questions as to why that might have worked. Um, so, yeah, that was fairly early on. I mean, that's 2008, which, you know, from a skill app point of view is quite a long time now. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I guess I intuitively make it up as I go along at times, but then most of it now feels like there's some research behind it, even if there wasn't, even if there wasn't then. I guess. No, I think the fascinating bit for me on that is the, the you've analyzed kind of data or, or or fights and stuff before which almost gives you a level of validity when you're then going with it it isn't a case of going well i've had an idea whilst i was out for a run today and yeah. this is what we're oh, gonna yeah. do it's one of those ones just going well actually no look this is a problem that we're trying to solve and actually here's a possible solution to the problem let's give it a go but it's always linking it back to that individual or that group of individuals which i think is far more powerful from a visionary point of view because it allows them to latch on to yeah we agree that this is the problem what we're maybe not aligned with straight away is what the solution is and you're saying that's fine we don't have to be aligned on this but okay. let's ch chuck enough things at it that we can then figure out as we go along, what the solution could be. So I think that, yeah, that use of probably the the 
the analytical piece of, of I, I, like in football, I've seen it occasionally with data. I know that when we did some um, work into our E triple P, they changed what shape we played because they said more teams were playing three at a back and they used the data to show us. And right. actually it was it was far more powerful than just going, we're just going to change. And I, I think that, yeah, this is yeah. a really nice way of actually how you can skillfully at the top end use data and analytics to highlight a problem, which are then going to focus on solving. Yeah, I think um, you, you've reminded me. So this was quite a humbling experience, to be honest, uh, but I'm happy to share it. That, um, so because I was such an analytical geek, I guess, I, I was sort of, told it it'd be really good for me to go to the Beijing Olympics because I was in charge of the 23 and uh, and 21 teams at the time, go to the Beijing Olympics as an analyst, which was great, you know, great experience. So I was, I was working with a guy um, who was our performance analyst at the time called Mike Bourne, who's now the director for performance of the LTA. He was previously director of performance, I think for UK sport. So he's, he's gone on some really big jobs, but we were effectively saying, who do we think will win the next match? And I, Bearing in mind, I'd been doing judo, you know, I was a national coach, spent all of my time analysing fights and stuff, but he was probably successful 80% of the time to my 20 because the way he looked at the fights was like, oh, this person struggles if they, if they move in this direction, they grip here and do this, then that person hasn't got a solution for that at the moment. And that completely changed the way that I saw everything, you know. So I was just like, interesting. Okay, how do I... So that's how I use the data. How do I turn that into a tr training methodology that, you know, so interestingly, that World Championships I was just talking about was directly after that Beijing experience where I was, you know, right, how am I going to train this based on all, all of these things that I've found? Um, so, yeah, that it was it was quite humbling, but probably very formative in terms of my use of data. And I'm still the same now in terms of you have to be, like you said earlier, there's so much you can just get lost in it all. So actually, how do we identify what to work on and prioritize what's the most important? Because there's just too many things, you know? So um, I always feel like we've never quite got it right because something crops up that you haven't prepared for, but then that's why um, that's why you prepare for it, like problem solving, isn't it? I remember with Jeremy Gibbons in the semi-final of the Olympic games, um, she had the current world champion, um, and she'd broken her thumb in, uh, I think, in the quarterfinal. So she couldn't grip. And we practiced different things. So the fight strategy was to to get the world champion to golden score, which is like any score wins. Um, and we knew she was really powerful, but she tired as soon as it entered that period. So it was like, just keep it going. But actually, Gemma couldn't grip. And so she naturally came over the arm and wrapped it and just caught the lapel, you know, inside with just her fingers and then threw her in golden school. So the strategy was still the same in terms of the profiling. But she found a way, you know, because we'd done an awful lot of just leaving them to find the solutions to her situations. And so that was probably one of my best examples of if we just went out there with a really clear plan and then you've suddenly got a broken hand, a broken thumb. She, has, she was operated on the next day, you know, so it was a, it was, it was a proper injury. Um, but if we'd have just pre-planned all our fight strategies, that wasn't going to work. So again, yeah, that was that was um, a pretty good moment, knowing that you've developed somebody who can find the solutions. And also, no, I mean, at London, nobody could hear you. Like you're shouting the tactics, but the crowd is so loud that um, yeah, nobody's hearing you anyway. So they really need to be able to to solve it themselves. You know? That that was a really interesting. Uh, I, we had a CPD event with um, Dave Horseman who when Southampton got relegated last year, he went and helped uh, the the first team as a coach and he hadn't worked at the, the um, top level previously. And that was his biggest observation. He said, the players really? can't, he said, the players can't hear you. He said, the centre backs cannot hear you. He said, so if you think you're going to tell a winger or a fullback on the far side and expect them to be able to hear you in old traffic when there's 60,000 people, you've got no hope. He says yeah. that actually the strategies that you use are completely different. Um, so I, th I, I found that fascinating. Like you said, from a learning point of view, actually, how do you create decision makers? Because they're going to need to be if they can't hear the coach and can't have it. 
Um, and also, is there a way around it as a coach that you can use codes? I know in American football, what they do at the college level, they have like signs that they hold up to help the players understand. So actually, yeah. that might be in affordance from a football perspective. The players understand what the codes are that might allow you just to give a bit of information to support. Yeah. But it's um yeah, it, it's a it's a type of thing that you wouldn't even consider until you're in that environment. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, one of the things we tried to prepare for was also, you know, you talk about that frenzied environment, but also the silent environment. So you go to the Olympic Games thinking, like, oh, it's going to be on it from the first thing. But if your first fight of the day at nine o'clock, most, most people haven't sat down yet. And actually, there's no atmosphere whatsoever. And yet you have to go out there and deliver a really big performance. So, you know, just mixing up the environment so they become comfortable with whatever it is. Like we used to sort of say, actually, you need to be comfortable fighting in a cupboard um, where there's nobody there or in front of like 80,000 people in a stadium. You're the same, you know. And so, but how do you do that? You do it by constantly creating different environments where they have to just switch on regardless and start to find those yeah, those commonalities that allow them to do that. Um, but ultimately, I think if you just mix it up all the time, yeah, they kind of find a way, really. But I'm I'm fascinated by football because, you know, you, you sort of see the likes of Jurgen Klopp and Guardiola, who are clearly amazing coaches, but they spend all their time screaming at the players, you know. And I just think, oh, wow, I, I, I wouldn't expect that, you know, from the best coaches in football. And like you said, like, can they even hear them? I th- judging by Kevin De Bruyne's uh, reaction in the Champions League final, sometimes they can, but they don't want it. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's fascinating, isn't it? It's like, I mean, one of my favourite areas is augmented feedback. And it's like, augmented essentially means to add something. So by feeding back to them all the time, are we actually adding anything anyway? Like you're actually getting in their way sometimes, you know? So um, again, it's an area I feel that I understand wow, but I haven't nailed it in terms of actually making sure my feedback's always optimal for the athlete but at least I'm conscious of it you know is is this adding something um you kind of got that task intrinsic feedback that you're interrupting every time um you do that so is it important enough to interrupt that process and you know prevent their own learning I guess yeah, I mean, listen, I'm going to be careful on how much advice I do give Pep and Clark, considering they're probably, <laughs> I'm probably definitely not giving them advice. Bit, no. But I agree with you. I, I do question sometimes how much of it is actually for that specific player and how yeah. much of it is a environmental thing where actually they're, they're trying to get crowd input in terms of yeah. raising intensity or trying to show a level of urgency, which then might see the visual cues for it from people around so i don't necessarily think it's always the actual message that's being given i think it's more of a case of how they're delivering it and what the effects that has that's just my perception though i could be completely wrong and they might say they might say no kevin hears me because he will be off if he doesn't hear me (laughs) um but yeah we'll we'll see um and then one well one last question before i finish up I think one of the, the fascinating thing, I, I, I like watching MMA in particular. And one of the things that, that fascinates me is probably the different cultures that you have around the world in terms of the way that people fight. Yeah. Uh, so you look at like the Dagestanians from Russia that have a, normally the Khabib style wrestling, get into the ground and, and, and throw them around. You've got the Brazilians that come quite flary with their different striking techniques and whatnot. From a judo perspective, I guess one, do those micro cultures exist? And then two, um, when you talk about those three or four day training events post um, competition that you discussed earlier, how much can you be purposeful and get an exposure to those type of things if you can't normally get training partners for that type of technique? Yeah, it, I mean, that's the difficulty. In fact, that's possibly why it's easier to train women because you can use men to be a bit stronger than them if it, you know if you find somebody stronger and you can't always get that for the men um and some of the russian like it's exactly the same you've got mongolians that are phenomenal you know mongolian wrestling russians have got samba wrestling as a culture um brazilians brazilian jiu-jitsu but it, it's very flowing they've got an awful lot of japanese have transferred to um brazil and leaving their mark there and then the japanese as i mentioned earlier you know, but they're so different. And so one of the things that I would try and do um, is not just understand their technique and their 
methodology, but to understand their culture. So with the under 21s, we, we used to go to each of those countries and spend like two, three, four weeks there getting to grips with them, but just understanding what it's like to be them. So we were the first Olymp- Olympic team to go to Cuba um, to their national training center. And they had a lot of world champions at the time, but these were people that were just absolutely fighting for their lives. If they, if they got good at judo, that this was a way out for them. And bearing in mind when we got there, they had no running water. You know, these people were world champions and they didn't even have running water in their national center. So they, because it was a, agreed with the Olympic committee, um, they would bring a tanker every day of water for our building and fill it up and we could have showers but just such an eye opener for what they were actually dealing with. And uh, no wonder they will fight until they absolutely drop, you know, because this is just their way out. Um, And so by spending time in all the different cultures, you really understanding what drives them as people, as well as what's led to the techniques, because anybody can analyze their techniques and what do they try and do. But, you know, by understanding their culture and the way that they train, I think you just get a much more greater feel for both their strengths and their weaknesses. And then, so Hopefully, by the time they came out of my own 21 squad, they had a good feel for that. And we would mimic different countries. Um, as they moved into under 23s, the skills they'd developed there in terms of mimicking a country's styles meant that you might have this opponent. Actually, they grip like a French in terms of coming over this side, but they put their hips in like a Korean. Or And so be, because you've got that understanding of the global um nature of the sport that would allow you to start to become more bespoke on the opponents and that lends itself to the highest end where yeah and just it it just for me it sets the scene for all of that but i do think understanding them as as people and cultures is really important um the interesting thing for brits is that we you know it was like the England football team years ago where it was just like right go straight to goal every single time um and I remember taking the team to Brazil and we played football with them and they were more than happy to just pass the ball around and to do fancy skills and we were like we want to beat Brazil and the second we get the ball we're going to go straight towards goal and I was watching it and I thought this is incredibly similar to our judo compared to theirs they're playing judo and they're trying all these things and um we just want to succeed i threw them they didn't throw us and i kind of thought okay how do i create this learning culture in a naturally our culture probably doesn't do that so it that was, again was probably quite a formative realization of seeing the different cultures and some of them lend themselves to this openness to try um and actually to to have flair is more important than to to score, you know, for some of them and stuff like that. So it's like, how do we switch that on at times so we can reap the benefits of it, but then go back to that, we need to win when we need it? Because actually that's our biggest strength. Um, but actually when we're trying to learn, it's our biggest weakness, you know? So Yeah, and that, that's where, when we talk about play, I think that's where it comes into because you're not necessarily like fighting to win when you're in training. You're actually playing to learn to win so yeah. actually that probably play culture really helps you with your skill development because you're not just focused on well I won this game and I know like Man United back in the day it was winning training at all costs and stuff but actually if you look at um, South American footballs are very similar I had Michael Lothman on here who worked over with um, Orlando Pirates or Kaiser Chiefs one of the two um, and he spoke about South African culture where you know they would be more uh, more exude by uh, a nutmeg than they would by finishing the goal. And actually it's kind of understanding that play culture, but if you can use it, it it allows you to almost take the pressure off that skill development bit, because it's not just focused on, I have to win. It's focused on, well, no, we can play a little bit here, which gives you a bit of freedom to give something a go. So I think that's a really fascinating point. And then, And then your point around the the Cuba stuff, I think, is really interesting. I heard a, a interview with Yoel Romero, who was a wrestler that's obviously gone into MMA, and he discussed the Olympic program and basically said they fight for their lives because they uh, the ones that are at the top get food first, mm. and there was kind of a food first hierarchy, which was your top ones after a day's training get the food they need. And then it gets less and less and yeah. less. And so you talk about understanding cultures. Well, yeah, yeah they they are 
you know, that that is basically they're fighting for food on the table, essentially. Um, So I think that all those bits are fascinating to discuss. Yeah, no, agreed. And uh, to be honest, it's um, it's been fascinating conversation because all of these things I've kind of forgotten, but then not quite, you know, so they obviously have an impact on you. But um, yeah, it's just that's the thing, isn't it? The great thing about judo is a global sport. So I think I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure more countries competed in the Olympics in judo than any other sport. So that actually just naturally makes it very difficult, you know, to, to win a hat full of medals. Um, but, but in the same time, that's kind of the beauty of it. You know, like people are like, Oh yeah. Like Kazakhstan, you know, when there was the Borat thing out and I was just like, that is absolutely nothing like Kazakhstan. Like, you know, and I'm just, <laughs> and everybody's like, how would you know what Kazakhstan is like? You know, I'm like, Kazakhstan's a beautiful country. Like what, you know, and I just couldn't, really see the joke in it because I've been there and it's they're not like that at all you know so but I mean how many people know that really not so many you know so yeah very fortunate to be in a sport where I just constantly travel to these obscure countries and yeah actively try and understand their culture because it might give you a bit of competitive edge I suppose yeah and I think that for me just before I ask the last question it's probably really highlighted two bits for me from a football perspective is one need to keep reminding myself to coach the other team so if you're trying to get outcomes coach the opponent and you talk about you know doing a french grip with a korean hip all that type of stuff well actually you can simulate that in football in terms of the types of pressure you use and what you're asking to do so coach the other team maybe more so than yours because it allows them to solve problems but then equally i think we do an incredibly poor job of kind of cross competing cross training i look at hard knocks with the american football they quite often do inter-team training camps for two or three days and they go up against opposing defenses and opposing offenses so you'll have the tampa bay buccaneers versus the philadelphia eagles for a three-day camp in oh, football yeah. that i'm aware of we don't do that too much too often and i, I question why because actually i think that you know if you if you were tottenham maybe going out to Sevilla for a couple of days and training against them you like um, coordinating that that puts you in a really good perspective where their strikers are trying to do something different that might be replicable to what Man City do and it's different to the the everyday so I think that for me those are two main points I'm taking away from this conversation going actually could already be done a bit better which is the whole purpose of this podcast well it's interesting because you look at you know some of the teams now are starting to be owned by effectively owned by the same groups and stuff so they've probably got more opportunity to do that. I don't know if any of them are, but um, yeah, it definitely sounds like a way forward. Yeah, for sure. Right. Last question for me, which is uh, someone to ask everyone, but if I were to ask the people that you work with, or now I guess uh, lecture or um, coach to describe you in three words, how would you hope they described you and why? Oh, um, firstly, caring, I guess. Like I, I think there's a really true truism of, of um, before they, they know how much you know, they want to know how much you care. Um, so I would always hope, probably more with athletes and students, because you just don't get the same connection with students. And I found that quite intriguing. Like, you know, it's just, I'm, I'm there wanting to have the same connection as I've got with the athletes I'm coaching. Um, secondly, probably innovative. I'm always looking. So I, I think it's a key thing in terms of the athlete feeling that we're always trying to find an edge, trying to find something new. Um, and that seems to be something that builds their confidence. So I, I guess innovation. Um, and then, yeah, uh, third one, probably togetherness. Like I, I don't think um, achieving anything on your own is not that much fun. If I'm honest. So one of the best things after the London Olympics and probably where I realised this is um, because it was the home Olympics. So, for example, the, Anna, the performance lifestyle was actually backstage, you know, where she wouldn't be normally. You just go abroad and she's not there. And seeing how much like Gemma's Olympic medal meant to so many people just thought this, that's actually what makes it worthwhile. You know, it's not, you can very easily think it's that coach athlete dyad, um, but it's so much more than that. And so what I've always tried to do, certainly with with Natalie, she's got this whole multidisciplinary team wrapped around just her, but is, you know, how do we make sure that everybody's a real driver in this and feels 100% part of it? Um, so I, 
I guess I'd hope those three. Um, but what would they actually say? They've told me and I'm not going to tell you. So. <laughs> That's why I go for the hope version rather than what the yeah, people absolutely. actually say. <laughs> Sorry, I got through the whole conversation about <laughs> coughing and had a go at the end. But now, listen, Darren, I think an amazing conversation, a brilliant insight into obviously your journey, but also kind of judo as a culture and what skill acquisition and problem solving looks like. So really appreciate your time and hope we can catch up again soon. Yeah, Michael, thanks a lot. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.